Okay, let's get started here. Uh, final exam is one week from today, 1 3 p.m. in this classroom. Uh, we will spend part of the next class reviewing for you, so please come prepared to ask questions if you have them. My office hours on Thursday, December 6th, um, at least I will not be there at the beginning of those office hours. Uh, I hope to be there at towards the end of my op 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 towards the end of the office hours. As many of you know, we will be um, interviewing candidates for the department head position in our department starting on Thursday, and there's something I need to go to right about the time that uh, I would have office hours. Um, also later today, we will do evaluations. So are there any questions before we get going here? Okay, so we're going to do this additional section called parallel processing. Now, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the semester, um, I told you that I normally have uh, students in this class do presentations, and it usually takes two to three days of classes um, to actually get through all the presentations. And since we weren't going to do presentations this semester, I knew that um, you know, we have some extra time. And so one of the days was taking up taking a test. I'm sure all of you were happy about that. <laughs> uh, actually, it, it, it is kind of better, because normally I just give a midterm and a final in this class. But now that you have more tests, um, if you don't do good on one, you're not as, um, it doesn't hurt you as bad as if, if that was only the midterm. Anyway, uh, so another topic that I wanted to cover was how can we speed up bootstrap calculations? And um, this is important because, you know, obviously the bootstrap is a Monte Carlo simulation. You know, it takes time. And especially if every iteration of your Monte Carlo simulation takes a long time to calculate a statistic, let's say, for example, you had to do some kind of optimization at, for every single data set in a Monte Carlo simulation, it's going to take time to do the bootstrap. Also, if you're doing, you doing research and you're trying to evaluate a particular bootstrap method through using Monte Carlo simulation itself, as you have done for some projects here, you know that that can take time too. Um, and so it's nice to be able to have a way to speed up these kinds of calculations. You know, one way to do it is through parallel processing. Um, I think this is the, the next computational revolution uh, that's occurring in statistics right now. Because with the release of R 2.14.0 in, I think it was September or October of last year, um, R included a package called Parallel. It's automatically installed in R, and it really allows you to do these parallel computations. Uh, I, people have been doing parallel processing for a long time, and you can actually have done it in R in, in the past. But this has really helped make parallel processing uh, a lot more accessible, let's say. Um, now, uh, before, um, I guess, this semester, I really didn't have too much of a background parallel processing. I had... Um, uh, fooled around with it a little bit with some of my research, but I really didn't go too far with it. Um, so I spent about 15 hours over fall break teaching myself parallel processing in the context of R, and these 30 pages of notes is what came with it. So I guess it takes me two hours, you know, a half hour per page of notes, which is kind of depressing. Anyway, uh, so I'm not an expert on this. This is what I learn myself over over these over fall break. Um, and uh, when I got done with that, I was like, yeah, this is this is pretty good and I, I hope to incorporate this in my research in, in the future. Okay. So uh, page one. Now in order to talk about parallel processing, um, the, the there's a variety of different forms of parallel processing, and we're going to talk about one that's often referred to as embarrassing, embarrassingly parallel. And this is what Monte Carlo simulations are typically. Um, and what this means is that you know, for every, let's say, data set or every iteration of a Monte Carlo simulation, we're repeating the exact same calculation, maybe on a different data set, each time. And in fact, if one wanted to, if let's say you had, get my red pen out here, let's say if you had capital R equal 500 
different data sets that you're analyzing in the Monte Carlo simulation, um, what you could do is for one of the data sets, uh, do it on one computer, or another data set, do it on another computer, or another data set, do it on another computer, because what happens on, let's say, data set one or iteration one is not going to affect what happens on iteration two, it's not going to affect what happens on iteration three, and so on. So this is why this is called embarrassingly, embarrassingly parallel, because the computations could be all done for every single iteration, or every single data set, at exactly the same time. Now, the most common form of actually implementing parallel processing in the past has been actually for, let's say, every iteration, I'll, I'll just call it iteration instead of data sets, for every iteration, actually farm it out to different computers, or I should say maybe sets of iterations, farm it out to different computers. So, for example, you might have something like this. Let's say you have a computer. This is often referred to as the master computer in parallel processing terminology. And you're interested in repeating something 1,000 times in a Monte Carlo simulation. What, would, what could happen is, is if you have access to four other computers, you can farm out 250 of them to computer number one, which is often referred to as worker number one. Farm out 250 to worker number two, 250 to worker number three, and 250 to worker number four. Each of these workers perform the necessary calculations and then send back the results to the master and the master then puts them all together and then summarizes them. Like for example, maybe calculate a true confidence or a type 1 error rate. That's parallel processing. It's been done in, in, in for a very long time like this. But around about 2006, multi-core processors started coming out uh, for just personal computers. I, in fact, now, you know, like my smart smartphone, has a two-core processor in it. What, what this basically means is, is, is this, is that now you can imagine this kind of a diagram existing in one computer itself. Um, maybe we can think of it a different way. Suppose this is your CPU on your computer. Now the CPU has basically two, you could say, processors, or what are often referred to as cores, inside of it. So here's core one, and here's core two. That would be a, 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 um, a dual core processor. A quad core would have a four of them there, and, and so on. And so it's essentially like having multiple, multiple computers within a computer. Um, so this started happening about 2006. And the nice thing about this then is it makes it more accessible to do parallel processing to a, uh, to a regular everyday researcher. Because in order to do, oops, you're slowing down here. In order to do something like this, where these were actually individual computers, you had to know how to communicate amongst the computers, which is not necessarily um, a simple thing. It, it can be done. But it's not necessarily a simple thing for a common everyday researcher. Now, if everything's inside your computer, it's going to be a lot easier. Also, the computer, the, co the communications that would have to take place because you have multiple cores here will be faster than having to compute, to actually go outside your compu computer communicate with other other computers. Okay. So most processors nowadays are multiple core processors. Uh, Intel processors processors take this even a step further. Uh, they introduce something called threading. And each core can have what's called multiple threads. What a thread is you can think of of a set of computer instructions that will be executed by a computer. And in, in Intel core proce in Intel processors, and let's say I have a two core processor here, with each core, it will have two threads. So essentially, you can think of this happening. 
let's say I send a, a set of uh, instructions to my first core. And then I send a totally separate set of instructions to the first core as well. Now these cores can only do one set of instructions at a time. So you might think, okay, how's that going to help you? Because you know this core here is going to have to wait for this set of instructions to get done first before it can do this set of instructions. However, often what happens with these set of instructions, the Senate, let's say this core, the processor is going to have to wait for some other information done by your, by your, produced by your computer before it can proceed with this set of instructions. So normally this would be idle then this processor while it's waiting. Instead, it will jump down to this set of instructions and execute those. When we get to a point where we have to wait for something else, and we'll go back to this and so on. So you can see that there's some advantages to having a multi-threaded core. I've only seen two threads per core. I don't think you would probably want to do more than two threads. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but I've only seen two threads per core. And Intel is the only one who does that. AMD does not for their chips. Okay. Is everyone okay so far with this? Now, let's look at some examples. So my Fujitsu tablet PC here has an i5 processor, Intel i5 processor. It has two cores running at 2.4 gigahertz apiece. Uh, here's specifications. Does anyone know how you get to, has anyone, everyone seen something like this on their computer before? Does anyone need me to show you how to get to it? Good. Um, if you simply go under uh, start button, control panel, uh, you see performance information and tools. And you see some default information come up. Uh, Microsoft started putting this in, in, in computers once uh, Windows Vista came up in terms of this kind of summary. And then if you come over here to view and print detail performance, this is what we're interested in. I don't know why my computers run slow, but it is. Um, and so this is basically uh, what I screen captured on my screen here and, and put into my Word document. So you can see i5 processor, each one went 2.4 gigahertz. I have 8 gigabytes of RAM in my computer. The key is this right here. Number of processor cores, two. Okay. So I have a, I have a, a dual core processor. To get a little bit more information about the processor itself, I went to the Intel website for the i5. It came out in quarter one, 2010. I actually got this computer in um, quarter three of 2010. Um, and the key thing to look at is this right here. Number of ports two, number of threads four. So I have four threads available to me. You'll see how that is important coming up. Um, you can actually have R tell you the same kind of information as well uh, in, in terms of the number of cores. In this package in R called Parallel, and again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is automatically installed in R. If I say Library Parallel, there's a function called Detect Cores. Notice it comes back with four. However, I only really have two ports. I just have four threads. So by default, it actually gives you the threads, not the cores. If I then say de detect cores logical equal false, I don't know if they did that kind of as a joke uh, the, for people who made this package. Two, meaning, you know, it's logical to actually detect, to say two cores, because that's what you have. So logical equal false, two. Anyway. Perhaps it's not as funny to you as it is to me. Uh, so try that on your own computer when you get home. See what comes up. You don't really know what the answer is. Um, in my computer, I also have a Dell desktop computer. I purchased this in August of 2010. I purchased this so that I could use it for simulations and so that my students can use it for simulations. It has an AMD processor with it. Again, AMDs are not multi Reddit. 
each processor runs at 3.2 gigahertz. And so if I de do detect cores, I have actually six cores. That was the most you get at that time. I did that knowing that it will help me uh, with simulation studies in, in the future. That's why I purposely have six cores. So it's like having six computers. Anybody heard of the Holland Computing Center on campus? Okay. They are located in the old athletic department offices just south of the stadium, football stadium at least. Um, it actually kind of fits underneath the stands of the stadium a little bit, I think. And they, uh, in um, um, early 2012, I think it was, they got a new supercomputer super there called Tusker. And it is quite the supercomputer. Computer. Uh, you can go to this website to get more information about the supercomputers there, and Tusker in particular. This is the website. So they have a number of supercomputers there. And they give you all the specs towards the bottom. And, you know, again, I'm still learning some of this stuff. And this is my best understanding of what Tusker is. It has 106 nodes. Basically, what you can think of this as 106 different parts to the computer that could be totally separate. that are all kind of together, combined together into one uh, room. You can and uh, with each of these 106 nodes, they have 64 cores. So you take 106 times 64, you get 6,784 total cores. Each will run at 2.1 gigahertz. Now, if you notice here, it also says four CPU, and I'm not quite sure exactly, to be honest, what that means um, in, in, in this context. Um, note that each, each node has 256 gigabytes of RAM. That's a lot. That is a lot. Um, and this is what, you know, researchers in physics, computer science, and other areas on camp, uh, other uh, really computationally heavy uh, departments on campus, this is what they use to do their research. Okay. I use the, the parallel package and detect cores. Um, uh, uh, on Tusker and got 64. So what this is telling me is just returning for one node that I was on. I had 64 cores. Um, I would assume that you could access other cores at the same time, but I just don't have to do it yet. Did you go down there just to do that? No, I can. Oh. I log on from my Oh, house. you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, I go out of my way and I go down the um, they, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Holland Computing Center, the last 10 pages of the notes. Uh, but in my experiences with them this year, uh, they, are, they seem to be very helpful because, you know, they owe their existence there, you know, to us, the researchers. Because if we didn't do research, they would be there. And so they really seem to go out of their way to try to help you. Um, and they, they typically give a, um, one or two introductory sessions on what they do there per year. So if you're interested, I recommend attending those. And that's what I did to start learning about it. Um, and in fact, I mean, any kind of, um, if I have any large simulation studies that to do in the future, I'll probably put it on Tusker. Um, as if, 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 if you try to run large simulation studies in our departments, you might have run into problems and get into those details while I'm recording this. Uh, but um, this is going to make your life simple. Okay. So what about computation time? How, how much do you really benefit from doing parallel processing? Well, in that diagram that I had on page 9.2, you, know, you might think, okay, well, now since I have four workers, I'm going to reduce my computation time by one fourth, or two one fourth, I should say. It doesn't work out quite like that because the reason is, is that 
if these are multiple computers or multiple cores, you're still going to have some communication time uh, that you're going to have to take into account. And also, the master is eventually going to have to put everything together in the end into one form, and that takes some computation time as well. So, it should, you, your computation time should be at least a little bit greater than one fourth in that kind of a circumstance. And we'll see some examples coming up of how long it does take to do some of this stuff. Also, it gets a little bit more confusing than once you start factoring in multiple threads per core. Or you think of multiple threads per worker. Um, you know, because you know, only one set of, comp set of computational instructions can run at a single time on a, on a core, you know, it, it's, hard, it's hard to judge exactly what will happen in terms of the, the actual reduction in computation time before you, before you actually try it. So here's just some, some simple rules. A K-core process, K process, so K is some number, it's an integer, greater than one. A K-core processor with two threads per core is faster than a K-core processor with only one thread per core, assuming that the gigahertz are exactly the same. And then this makes sense. Okay? A K-core processor with two threads per core, though, is much slower than a two times K processor with one thread per core if everything was at the same gigahertz. Because again, only one set of computations can be done at a time on a core. Okay, now the parallel package. Let's talk about that in detail. Um, there's a lot of packages out there in R that deal with parallel processing. Um, and you can go to this, what's called a task view on the Comprehensive R Archive Network, CRAN, uh, to see a listing of all the packages that allow you to do parallel processing. Uh, and as I mentioned before, back in 2011, R uh, put together this package called Parallel that, Parallel, that now was automatically installed with R. Um, and basically what it did was it took the two main packages that people had developed to do parallel processing, what, one was called Snow, one was called Multicore. It put them together into a nice form so that people could more easily access them. Uh, there is a vignette on Parallel, on the Parallel package, you can take a look at. And in fact, one of the examples that they give in the vignette is what inspired me uh, to do some of the computations I'm going to do next, um, because they do some bootstrapping in the vignette. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. We're going to use the air conditioning data. I'm sure all of you probably thought you never have to deal with the air conditioning data again. Well, ha, I guess we are going to do it one more time. Um, now, this example doesn't need parallel processing at all. Okay, well, I mean, if you remember with the air conditioning example, we were dealing with the mean and doing some stuff with it. But I purposely use a simple example so that you know, we're familiar with the, the actual computations itself. It's the computations itself. We're just not necessarily familiar with how to implement it in a parallel processing context. So first of all, I'm going to use my tablet PC here. Uh, let's look at how we do some of this stuff without parallel processing. Basically, all I did was I copied and pasted some stuff in Chapter 2. So as review, here's my data set. I think it's a sample size of 12. Uh, sample means 108. I call up the boot package. I write a calc.t function that calculates the mean. And I'm going to use a value of R in terms of my number of resamples to be 1 million. Now, in actual application, don't ever take 1 million resamples. You're not going to need that many. I'm only doing it here so that my, my computations here take a little bit of time. So that's why I'm doing 1 million. So I'm going to uh, check the time when I start the computations. I run my boot function like normal. I end my time calculations, and you can see it took about 0.4 minutes. Okay. Now let's do parallel processing. We're going to do exactly the same thing here, but using parallel processing. 
it's, it's, it's a still, even though you know, they wrote this new package to do this stuff, uh, it's still a little bit um, clunky, and that's some word to describe it. It's not as, as easy, I think, as I would like, uh, but it, it, it can be done. It can be done. Okay. What I'm going to do is use two cores. And I decided just to, um, remember I have a two core process. Uh, I decided to put an object called number.cores. I didn't need to actually do that. I just chose to do that for this particular case because I'm going to change the number of cores later on. And I'm going to use a function called make cluster. Often you hear in parallel process, processing, people talk about clusters. Just uh, you can think of it as a cluster of computers that are all hooked together, or a cluster of cores that are all hooked together. So I'm going to make a cluster where I'm going to specify the number of cores to be two. It's going to go into an object called CL. So CL doesn't just contain the number two; it actually contains some other stuff in it um, that's going to be used by some functions. Also, what make cluster does, it actually opens up two more R sessions. So right now, I have an R session open. It's actually going to open up two more. So let's try it out. So what I'm going to do, pull some of this stuff out. What I'm going to do now is open up the task manager. Um, you know, there's a variety of different ways to do that. So just I right clicked on my task bar down here. I right task manager. Task manager. You, know, you can also do the control off delete to get to it. And you can see everything that is being run now in R. I'm sorry, in on my computer. And let's go down to here. Oh, that's one. Okay. Um, This rgui.exe is what you see here. Now, by me using this make cluster, I had two more R sessions open up. This is how R with the parallel package does parallel processing. It, you can kind of think of this as your master R. And then it opens up two worker R's that will run on two different processors. Now, if you notice here, there's actually some other stuff, two other R things open as well. Um, I was playing around with R earlier today when I was preparing for the lecture, and I think I did something that uh, opened these up. So I'm going to end it. Make sure I end all. Notice it also says R script. Does anyone know what a script file is? Anybody heard of batch mode? Or like, like ever run SAS in batch mode? Basically what this is doing is running R in batch mode. Where it's not the full blown you know, system here that we see. Rather, um, it actually uh, runs R um, and then creates a file that has all of its output. And basically what this parallel package will do is transfer this file into this and then do some summary without getting all the details. Okay. So let me actually run this code again. Let's see here. So please make this little change here in the code. I, I, the code that I gave you will run, uh, but when I was going over my lecture notes today, I was like, you know, I think it would be helpful if I made a small change here. I'm going to call this temp. And so what you see here is I'm writing a function called per.core, and I'm going to pass one bit of information into it called temp. And basically on each of my cores, this function is going to run. 
So what I need to do is actually, within inside of it, put everything that these separate R processes are going to need in order to run. So notice, I actually have to put in my data again. I'm going to put in my value of R. Notice it's 500,000 now, because each core is going to run half of my, do half of my resampling stuff. So that's why it's not a million. Yeah, it's just 500,000. Also, I need to tell each of these R sessions that open up, okay, I'm going to use a boot package just like how we would normally. Even though we've already done it in my original R session, I need to tell it again because I have separate R processes, or I should say separate R sessions running in the background. I need to put in my calc.t. So notice I'm enclosing a function within a function. And then my boot function. If I wanted to, I didn't really need to put this part here. Because remember what happens when you end a function, the last line gets returned to the user. So these two separate R sessions will return the results from this one boot back to my original R GUI. And then we're going to do some stuff that actually puts it all together in the end. Any questions? So in the per dot core, um, the beginning of the function, yeah. so you're putting in temp, but where does temp come in within the yes. function? Oh. Yes. It actually will be meaningless in the end. That's why I decided to call it temp versus y, because you might get confused with the y that's there. Okay. So, you know, whenever we run the boot function, we always set a seed first. So we said set dot seed something. And what this does, it creates uh, what's often referred to as a stream of random numbers that R will use to help simulate whatever kind of data that you want. We can't use set.seed here. The reason being is because now we are having to open up two new R sessions. And we need to have C numbers sent to both of them. But we need to make sure the C numbers are not exactly the same. So when I was first playing around with parallel processing, this is like two years ago, I could not figure out how I could have my two different R sessions have different C numbers because I was keep on having to get I was uh, I was having the same results duplicated twice when I was doing it on a two core processor, um, and so at that time then I said okay I got to do other stuff I can't worry about that I'll deal with it later. Anyway, this is how then you can set the C numbers so that you have basically two what's called streams of C numbers going to the different cores, and it's called cluster set. RNG stands for random number generator stream. The first argument, CL, and it just so happens I call my clusters that I set up CL. So it knows, okay, you need two streams. And then an overall C number then for these two streams is 9182, which was exactly the same numbers that we used previously when we were working with just one core. I use the same C number there just for convenience you will not get the same, um, same resamples in the end. Okay? You will not get the same resamples in the end. So now I say uh, start my clock. Do proc.time. And I'm going to put the results into something called boot.res2. And this is how then you actually do everything in the end. Use a function called do.call. I'll explain what that is in a little bit. And inside this function, you see something called par l apply. And some information printed there. I have a description of par. Is it par I'm sorry. Did I say par dot l apply? It's just par l apply. I have a description of it on page 11 in the notes. I'm going to actually go over here to, to Tim. We'll get some of this. So this par l apply, notice it has the word apply there. We've seen the apply function before. You know, apply allows you to apply a function 
to rows of a matrix or columns of a matrix. There's also, a, and then it returns the result as basically a vector. There's also a function called L apply, which does the same kind of thing, but now works with lists instead. So for example, I'll give a nice little example of my notes on page 11. bottom page 11. So let's say I'm going to actually copy and paste this into R. So let's say I create this list called X. It has three components to it, A, beta, and logic. Notice they don't have to be the same length or anything. That's the beauty of a list. Um, and then if I say L apply, and notice the little addition here. I put this here just to help you out. Capital X equal fun equal fun for function. X is the data that we're going to summarize. Copy and paste this into R. What happened is that the L apply function applied the mean function to each of the components of my list. It found the mean. Okay. So remember that. Now when we go to the par L apply function, par stands for parallel L apply. It's going to do something similar, but not, not exactly the same. So par L apply, I have to specify again what my clusters are. And for I'm going to apply the per dot core function per cluster. Now this is the, the weird part. I have this x argument, and I'm going to put 1 to the number of cores that I have. So it's just simply going to be a vector. It's going to have the value of 1. It's going to have the value of 2. Again, this is going to be weird how this works. So for the first element in x, it's going to run the per dot core function. It's going to come up here. For temp, it's going to pass in the value of 1, and it's going to run the function. Is there anything in here that has the word temp in it? No. So in other words, it's just kind of a dummy value that I'm passing in there. Then, when x is equal to 2, it's going to run the per dot core function. It's going to pass in 2 for temp, and then run everything that's inside there. Since I'm using the part L apply function with two cores specified in CL, it's going to run the per dot core function at the same time in two different R sessions. So again, this X argument works. You know, this is where I think it's a little clunky the code. It's just kind of a dummy argument that you need to put in there uh, for this par L pi function to work the way that you want it. The key is that this number of cores needs to be the same as the number of cores that you put in there. Otherwise, as I specify on page 12, so let's say that instead you set x equal 1 colon 3. So now it's a vector 1, 2, 3. What will happen is that R runs per dot core twice on one core, and then also it runs it one other time on another core. Now since I have specified R equal 500,000, I actually want 1 million resamples, it's actually going to replicate one of the 500,000 resamples, which we obviously wouldn't want that to happen. Okay, so is that making sense? Is the par L apply function making sense? And it's clunky. Don't blame the instructor, blame the people who wrote the function. Okay. Now, remember this is just one part of this do dot call. Uh, do dot call. I, I haven't used it too much. This function It's just a way to say, "R, go do this function." Um, I haven't really had a, had a reason to, to use it um, really too much before. And in do dot call, there's an args argument. That's where you put the par l apply. And what that says then is that. Uh, hold on. Wait a second. Let me explain this this argument. What? This argument says, what function do you want to apply to all the results that come back from par L apply? 
C is the C function. Remember, that's combine or concatenate. And the C function is actually generic. And what's going to happen is that, remember this per dot form at the very last line has the boot function. And so what's going to come back is a class of boot. Then, so what's going to happen is you're going to have two objects come back. Both have a class of boot. The C function is generic. It's going to try to combine those two objects that come back. Since the salt class was boot, it will run actually the c.boot function that happens to exist, and it will combine everything nicely so that in the end everything will look like we only ran one implementation of the boot function. Let's try this out and so you can see what happens. Well, it's running faster than I had to spend, or slower than I had to spend. I have a feeling that maybe I screwed things up when I was um, canceling processes, R sessions, I mean. Let's try this. So who keeps on restarting their computer? Okay. Someone doesn't want to speak up. There we go. It took a little bit longer than it should have. I obviously in a classroom situation like this is hard to um diagnose what went wrong, but I did run it before class, and obviously when I was writing up these lecture notes, um, I had uh, run it as well and got everything to work. If you have problems with it, please let me know. But in the end, with two courses, it took 0.21 minutes. So I have a little bit, um, you know, before it took 0.4 minutes. So you can see that there's, there's obviously a, a time savings here. It's not necessarily half. You know, half as long, but there is some time savings. And, and, and if you actually then look at the boot.res2, that's what I put in the results from um, running do.call, you know, everything looks exactly the same as what we're used to seeing. Um, at the very end, you notice I say stop cluster? You need to put that there. This is what closes out those R sessions. Um, let's see if there's any other notes that I didn't talk about. So how do you know that your computer is actually using multiple cores? No? I think all of you are familiar with Windows gadgets. One Windows gadget that comes uh, with your computer by default is this Windows gadget here. Um, which allows you to monitor your uh, processor. Um, on, the, on the far right, let me see if I can make this a little bigger. There we go. On the far right here, let me move that down too. This shows how much memory you're taking up. So 43% of my memory is being used right now. Um, the, the big one here is the percentage of your processing power that's being used right now. And notice it says 29%.
but I'm not really running anything on my computer because all my programs are not necessarily doing computations. Um, and I think this is what, what, what screwed up um, the time uh, that we had in R. Um, this cam relay that I'm using to record my lecture, that takes up a lot. And it's actually taking up one core right now. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, why is it taking up one core when you see that it says 27% or 25%? This dial here is based upon four threads. Okay? So when I was running this program without recording my lecture, this is shown on page 13, I actually looked at this little gadget and it was at about 50%. So I was running on two cores using two of the four threads. So that's how you know that indeed multiple cores are being used. Just now everything is on top of here. Maybe just, just put that one back in. Anyway, well now you get to know what the temperature is in Honolulu right now. We were wondering why Honolulu. That's where I want to take my next vacation. <laughs> so it's just kind of a reminder. That's where I want to go next. In Dublin. Well, that's where I, I, I uh, went to a conference there about well, over a year ago. And I started watching the weather then, and I just haven't taken off like that stuff. So it's just kind of fun to see what their weather is. Anyway. Well, what you do is you actually say uh, for that number dot core, um, say four. So I know it's kind of confusing because it's not actually more cores; it's actually threads. So that's what you would do. Um, in fact, in fact, this is what we're going to kind of talk about next. Uh, well, shortly. So how do you know that uh, that make cluster actually opens up our other R sessions? We already talked about this. This is what my um, task manager actually looked like when everything was working exactly like it should. Um, but what happens, though, if you um, uh, actually look at if using different cores? So if I set my number dot cores to be something else, I'd try one through six just to see what would happen. Here's what's called, uh, I did some what's called benchmarking, where I wanted to evaluate how fast things were running. So I tried one core, and I got 0.39, obviously, two cores, 0.21, according to my notes. And then when I went up to three cores, and remember I have a two-core computer, so now this has taken advantage of multiple threads, I was down to about 0.18. So notice it does, it's not one-third of the 0.4 that we started off with. It's actually more than that one-third. And then I tried four threads, and then that's what I got. Notice it still goes down a little bit. It's still trying to take advantage of the, the threading, the po four possible threads, but definitely not as much as it went, went down to three. Now, you could actually say, well, use six. I'm sorry, use five, use six. And as you would expect, nothing's really going to happen. You're not going to get any kind of computational um, advantage because you don't have those cores. You don't have those threads. And lastly, before we do evaluations, now, as we kind of had here, there may be times when you want to stop code from running. And typically when you're in R, if you wanted to do that, there's a few ways. One way is to hit the stop button up here. You know, often this happens, you know, let's say you realize, oh, you made a coding mistake, but your program's still running, uh, and you want to stop what's going on. Well, what would happen if you did this when you were doing some parallel processing? Well, this R window would stop and come back to a regular old prompt. But the problem is, is that those other R windows that were opening up in the background, they will not stop. They will keep on running until they reach their end, or they will run forever if you had some really bad coding uh, error. Okay? So you would actually need to terminate them through the Windows Task Manager. Okay. So, on page 16, I discuss another package uh, that you can use to do uh, parallel processing. This is actually the first package that I ever tried. Uh, but I'm going to actually stop there for today.
so that we can do evaluations.